Got a fresher start to Tuesday. Lots of cloud across England, the exception being the southwest. Uh, a few heavy showers maybe in the south of England to begin with. One or two developing elsewhere. Uh, a few more showers as well across Scotland, Northern Ireland through the day, but actually fewer than we saw on Monday. Many places will stay dry, sunniest in Wales, the southwest of Channel Islands. And even though we've got the winds coming in from that northwesterly direction, a bit lighter wind than we saw on Monday. So when you're in the sunshine, actually, it should feel pleasant enough. But overall, 17 to 22 Celsius, a big departure from what we saw last week. And then into the evening with the showers that are around will gradually fade away, clearing skies, a few mist and fog patches as the air of high pressure gradually pushes its way in across the UK. Now what that will do means winds will be lighter but because it's coming off the Atlantic there'll be a bit of moisture tied in amongst it. So we'll start the day with a few showers in the southeast, most though lovely sunny starts to Wednesday but just notice how the cloud develops and spreads out into the afternoon. So the morning's sunny in the afternoon, although some coasts will say sunny all day long. And winds, whilst they'll be light, temperatures on par with Tuesdays at around 17 to 23 degrees. That actually represents a little bit lower than average. It's shown by the blue colours on our uh, anomaly chart. But notice how those blue colours disappear end of the week and into the weekend. The warmer yellows appear, temperatures actually creep a bit back up above normal once again. A sign that we'll see south or southwesterly winds head our way for the weekend. Temperatures in the mid-high 20s uh, potentially across parts of the south and east of England. Temperatures will rise further north and west, but always the chance of one or two showers here. That's how it's looking. See you soon. As the Conservative leadership race enters its next stage, the two remaining candidates vying for number 10 will take part in a head-to-head -head debate in front of a live studio audience. Find out where they stand on the big issues that affect you. Our next Prime Minister, tonight at 9 on BBC One and iPlayer. Exploring the media revolution. Everyone's entitled to an opinion. What they're not entitled to is invent facts. Get the background on the biggest stories. It's not so much that there's a risk you're being played, it's just that you have to go into it with your eyes open. The battle for influence and attention. When I write a tweet, if I have a 1% doubt about it, I won't send it. And the companies shaping the future. Linear television will die over time. The Media Show, Saturday at 4.30 on the BBC News Channel. It's 8 o'clock, you're watching BBC News. I'm Sean Lay in Stoke-on-Trent, where tonight Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss will have their first head-to-head -head debate. One of them will be the UK's next Prime Minister. Even before they meet in person, the two candidates have clashed today over immigration and over China. Tory Prime Ministers perhaps from more than Tory party members, perhaps from more than fewer than 200,000 will choose the next leader. The winner will be announced on September the 5th. Labour's leader Sakir Starmer attacked his Tory rival's approach. He accused them of indulging in Thatcherite cosplay. And the former leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, Lord Trimble, who went on to play an important role in Northern Ireland's peace deal and became his first First Minister, has died. Hello, good evening and welcome to the Victoria Hall in the heart of Stoke-on-Trent where this evening's Conservative leadership debate takes place. But we begin this hour with that breaking news. The death has been announced by uh, the Austrianist party of its former leader, Lord David Trimble. He was 77. 
Lord Trimble had been leader of the Ulster Unionist Party and he was also a key architect of the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement back in the 1990s. And along with that, he went on to serve as the first First Minister. For his efforts for peace, he was also awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Our Ireland correspondent Emma Vardy looks back on his life and career. David Trimble's reputation as one of the key peacemakers who led Northern Ireland out of conflict is due in no small part to his dogged determination. That real peace is at hand if there is not a beginning to the decommissioning of weapons. He was not only a Nobel Peace Laureate, but for a time a household name. But as the leader of what was Northern Ireland's largest unionist party, the Ulster Unionists, he was under almost constant pressure. Well, we're delighted to be back down the traditional route. The law professor before being elected to Parliament. As a politician, he could be prickly and temperamental. You are you distorting the situation, Mr Thompson, entirely. His reputation as one of the more staunch unionists in his party was solidified when he opposed police, trying to prevent a controversial march by the Protestant Orange Order from taking its traditional route through a Catholic neighbourhood, which led to a violent standoff at Drum Cree. But he later defied the hardliners as he entered multi-party talks with Sinn Féin, the political voice of the IRA. Those discussions eventually led to the Good Friday Agreement and Trimble became Northern Ireland's first First Minister. But many in his own party felt he'd conceded too much and that Sinn Féin could not be trusted, which led to a number of high-profile defections to the harder-line DUP. Many within unionism spoke openly against David Trimble and at the general election of 2001, the animosity spilled out of the polling station despite his narrow victory. Later elections saw the Ulster Unionist Party collapse from 10 seats to just one and David Trimble's policies were blamed. He eventually stood down as leader in 2005 and was later elevated to the House of Lords where he continued to make the case for unionist concerns during the Brexit negotiations. Like the nationalist leader John Hume, with whom he shared the Nobel Prize, David Trimble was said to have sacrificed his party for peace. In sharing power with Sinn Féin, he always stated that he had done the right thing. Though at the time it came with great personal and political risks, he will be remembered as instrumental in forging Northern Ireland's path to peace. That was Emma Vardy reporting and in a statement released by the Ulster Unionist Party about its former leader and on behalf of his family, the UUP said that Lord Trimble had died earlier today uh, peacefully after a short illness. Now, here in the Victoria Hall in Stoke-on-Trent, the audience is starting to arrive for tonight's debate. This will be the first occasion on which the two surviving candidates to be the next leader of the Conservative Party and therefore the UK's next Prime Minister debate head to head. It's a BBC debate. We'll be broadcasting it live here on the BBC News Channel and it's also going out on BBC One as well as online for viewers who want to follow it that way. Now this programme, which will be hosted by my colleague Sophie Rayworth, is before an audience of voters in Stoke. Why does that matter? Well, this uh, city, with its three parliamentary constituencies, went from Labour, which it had been for decades, over a period of time, first one seat, and then in 2019, the two remaining seats, to the Conservatives. And the audiences of those who voted Conservative at the last election. The challenge for these two candidates is to convince them, and the wider electorate watching at home, that one of them is best placed to be the country's next Prime Minister. Let's talk now to my colleague, Ione Wells, our political correspondent. Ione, we were talking a little earlier today about what the party candidates' expectations are, uh, the Liz Truss camp and the Rishi Sunak camp. What do you think the party more generally wants to get out of this debate? Well, I think what's interesting tonight, speaking to MPs, speaking to the campaigns themselves, is there is a want for less of this kind of blue-on-blue -blue fighting that we've seen emerge over the last couple of days and weeks in this campaign, with both sides attacking each other's records, but also attacking each other's current policies as well, whether that's Rishi Sunak uh, calling Liz Truss's economic plan fairy tale economics, or uh, Liz Truss's team uh, referring to Rishi Sunak's plans for migration as potentially in breach of international 
constitutional law. I think this sort of infighting has worried a number of Conservative MPs, and I think certainly one thing which, uh, well, the, the sort of campaigns are saying this evening, but also uh, Tory MPs have been looking for, is a sense that there is a candidate who can bring the party back together. Remember, we've had months and months of Tory infighting, of briefing against each other, and one of the things that frustrated so many of those ministers that had to resign from Boris Johnson's government was a feeling that they were all talking more about themselves than about some of the policies they're putting And forward. that's uh, particularly the danger, I suppose, during this rather protracted period. But this point in particular is quite important, isn't it? Because the ballot papers go out next week. That's right. This kind of week or two is now going to be really crucial. This campaign is going to run for the whole summer, uh, but I think there is a real consciousness among both camps that the next two weeks are crucial, with a lot of Tory members typically voting quite early, uh, a lot of them sort of having already potentially made up their minds. But that's not to say it's too late either. I, I was just told uh, by some MPs uh, that both candidates have been at a local cafe today here in Stoke-on-Trent, meeting some Conservative members uh, with some local MPs, Jonathan Gulley, who's a Liz Truss supporter, but also Joe Gideon, uh, who is a Rishi Sunak supporter. And both camps seem to think that they managed to successfully turn some supporters in the crowd from supporters of their opposition to <laughs> undecided. So I think that sort of change of mind is something which both candidates will be hoping for tonight, particularly because there is a feeling that some members have already made their mind up. It's difficult, though, isn't it? Because this is debate directly one-on-one. -on -one. This is, uh, you could call it blue-on-blue. -blue. It's not supposed to be a tax, but inevitably, in order to define yourself, you've got to find something uh, that's negative or at least less flattering to say about your opponent. That's right. I think there's two things that we'll see at play here. There is, of course, as you say, what attacks may come out against the other, but also how well can they defend their own policies against robust questioning, both from their opposition but also from our, our panel uh, this evening of, of questioners and interviewers as well. Now, I think certainly, as you say, that sort of how much that blue on blue fighting comes out is one that they'll be watching. Both campaigns say they want to move away from that. They don't want to shatter the party, as one supporter of Liz Truss uh, said this evening. Uh, but that sort of reunification of the party is something which both will be trying. Having said that, though, I think there will be an element to which both will be aware this is their real chance to get their message forward. Liz Truss has so far been topping a lot of the Tory members' polls. Rishi Sunak has uh, been topping some of those snap polls after previous debates. So there's a lot in this for both sides to try and make up for. Rishi Sunak, I think, in particular, feels like he's got to make up that gap between him and Truss in those members' we polls. We can see Rishi uh, Sunak arriving at the Victoria Hall. Presumably, they'll, they'll, they'll go off into their own roofs with their huddles of advisers last minute preparation but in the end once they get into the hall in front of the audience in front of the live cameras they're on their own that's right and anything could be thrown at them many questions uh, they'll have to react as well to what the other is saying and that's part of the preparation that will be going on at the moment how do they counter some of the lines they know that their opponent may have on them so you know, for example how does Rishi Sunak defend himself against Liz Truss's argument that tax cuts are what some of the Tory members want these are the kind of questions which they will be sort of preparing their answers for as we speak in terms of the questions they're going to be thrown as you say they'll face uh, some contribution as well from some of the voters that we have here tonight, not necessarily questions, but sort of more general thoughts and commentary which may feed into this. Uh, in terms of the questions themselves, uh, I don't even know what they're going to be, so <laughs> I couldn't tell you. And the candidates certainly why. don't, absolutely, and even if we knew, we probably wouldn't say in case anyone was listening. But seriously, in terms of uh, Liz Truss arriving, uh, she is positioning herself as the insurgent, the challenger against the political and economic consensus of the last 20 years. She's been in government longer than Rishi Sunak has. That's right, and I think it's really interesting there's a kind of spectre of Boris Johnson still really haunting this campaign. If you think about it, despite all the spin about change candidates, about you know a time for a clean start and uh, fresh ideas, these are candidates who were both in Boris Johnson's government. One is Boris Johnson's current foreign secretary, and one is Boris Johnson's former chancellor. Both of them face this uncomfortable and slightly awkward dilemma, really, of having to explain why it is uh, that they didn't implement some of these big ideas they had when they were in government. And also, I mean, I think there's also an interesting idea here of, uh, you know, how they sort of sell their vision going forward, given that there's not going to be a new general election. They are, in some sense, inheriting the mandate of Boris Johnson and also inheriting some of the unfinished business as well. Ione Wales, we'll talk to you again later this evening. It's going to be a fascinating debate. Thanks very much for now. That debate begins, what, in just under an hour's time here on the BBC News Channel. We're going to carry on with our coverage throughout the next hour in the run-up uh, to the hour of debate, which is also being broadcast live on BBC One. Now, the point that I only makes there about this being uh, inheriting the Prime Ministership is potentially a source of vulnerability for the Conservatives. 
The last three leaders, at least initially, were chosen by party members and became prime minister. The last two leaders became prime minister without a general election making them prime minister. They subsequently fought and won general elections, but they got the job first without a general election. This will be the third occasion on which that happens. No sign yet that either of the candidates is committing to going to the voters any time soon after they become party leader on the 5th of September. They're expected to travel to Balmoral on the 6th of September to, to kiss hands, as it were, to accept the Queen's Commission to form a new government. But that means that effectively the Prime Minister of the country will be chosen by, according to Chris Mason, about slightly less than a quarter of 1% of the public. And that is also, potentially at least, an area of political vulnerability. But what are the challenges the two candidates are facing tonight? Our political correspondent, Ben Wright, reports. This contest is now a duel, a scrap for the keys to number 10. Only Tory party members get to vote for the next Prime Minister, and tonight's debate will sharpen the choice in front of them, but it will also show us all what the two contenders plan to do with power. Morning. Right now, it looks like Liz Truss has the most to lose from the jeopardy and glare of a TV debate. Polls suggest that she's romping ahead of Rishi Sunak in the battle for Tory party members, but there are still weeks of campaigning to come. Well, I think the stakes here are high for the country because we're choosing a new Prime Minister and we have a chance here to choose a Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who has a vision for growth, low taxation and low regulation that will create jobs, increase wages and ultimately generate the tax revenue that will fund our public services. A tiny bit more. Yeah, tiny bit more. Yeah. It's the former Chancellor Rishi Sunak who needs to make up ground this evening. Well done. He's ripped into his rivals' plans for rapid tax cuts, saying they would harm the economy and fuel inflation. And the cost of living crisis is framing this leadership race. It'll come down to those big economic arguments and I think on that Rishi's sensible approach dealing with inflation first then looking to cut taxes is what people want to see because what we can't do is put the economy in jeopardy when we've already got inflation uh, running really high at the moment. It's already proved a punchy contest. Candidates have rounded on their government's own record and each other. Divisions within the party are being paraded for all to see. It's getting personal too. Today, the Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries mocked Rishi Sunak's taste for fancy tailoring in a tweet that prompted a backlash from some of her colleagues. While one government minister said the contest was puerile and embarrassing and risked putting the Tories out of power. Watching on, the Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer today trying to contrast his plans for the economy with the argument raging in the Conservative Party. In one corner you have Rishi Sunak, the architect of the cost of living crisis. In the other, you have Liz Trust, the latest graduate from the School of Magic Monetary Economics. Neither of them has the answers to the economic challenges that we face. But tonight's debate is a crucial chance for the would-be prime ministers to try and convince Tory party members they are credible and electable. With ballot papers set to hit doormats on August the 5th, there is now a small window for Rishi Sunak to try and close the gap on his opponent before the voting begins. For the candidates now prepping their attack lines and tactics, this debate will be the biggest test yet. Ben Wright, BBC News, Westminster. Well, let's talk now to a former Conservative advisor, political commentator, author of a book on William Hague's time as Conservative Party leader. She's Joanne Nadler. Joanne, thanks very much for being with us. How worried are you about the potential impact of some of these blue-on-blue -blue attacks we've seen? Um, I'm rather more worried this week than I was last week. I think that uh, there's always an element of... Um, punch and duty, if you like, about these contests. But I think now that it's come down to the final two, and one of these people will be the prime minister of this country uh, within the next few weeks, I think it's really time to uh, change the tone of this contest to a certain extent. It needs to be robust. Of course it does. There needs to be a debate. There needs to be scrutiny. But I think we don't want to see uh, so many of these ridiculous personal comments, these trivial comments, uh, because it really gives the impression of a party that is uh, not taking its responsibility to the public particularly seriously. What do you make of the two candidates, the choice that the MPs have handed to the party activists? 
frankly, I think it's pretty disappointing. Uh, I think that both of these candidates have uh, very strong points um, about them. Uh, I think both of them thoroughly deserved a place in the cabinet. Uh, but I think that this was an opportunity uh, not sought after by the members of the party necessarily, but an opportunity that MPs felt was essential to uh, have a new start, uh, to put behind it some of the scandals, real and in some cases exaggerated, of the past few months, uh, and to have a proper rethink about what the point of the Conservative Party is. And for my money, there was only one candidate who really was able to articulate uh, something of a more exciting vision, that was Kemi Badenoch, and because she's now not in the final two, um, I feel uh, rather, uh, shall we say, less excited than I did a month ago. They, both candidates have tried to wrap themselves in the mantle of Margaret Thatcher. Situations and circumstances are different. They both argued about her policy legacy. Have they grasped, do you think, what made her such a unique political figure, at, both for the Conservative Party and for the country? Um, yes, I, I think they have. Um, and in a sense, because they're appealing in the first instance to party members, uh, it's not unreasonable to want to associate themselves with uh, some of the successes and achievements of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, they know that that will play well to the party base. But on the other hand, I think they have to be very aware, for the reasons that I've said, that one of them will end up as prime minister, that their wider audience won't necessarily relate to that in the same way. And in many cases won't even understand what they're talking about. I mean, if you're if you're younger than 45, uh, then unless you've studied your politics closely, and why should you, quite frankly, if you're trying to get on with a busy life, you won't really understand what these references to Margaret Thatcher even mean. Now, you know, as somebody that's very interested in politics, I think that's a bit of a shame, but I think it's the reality. And I think, you know, it's another way in which sometimes the party appears just to be speaking to itself. Uh, Jan, let me ask you a final question. Can you see Rishi Sunak serving in a Liz Truss government? Can you see Liz Truss serving in a Rishi Sunak government? Because ultimately, if the party wants to reunite, that's kind of what they're going to expect, isn't it? Yeah, it's very interesting that you should ask me that, Sean, because uh, I was actually thinking that if I was advising either of the two camps, and I think you can tell from my tone that I'm not, um, I think I might be inclined to suggest that they ask that of each other, that would either of them serve in each other's cabinet? Because that might be a way uh, to try and bring this, um, the, the status of this debate, and I don't just mean the debate this evening, but I mean over the next few weeks, uh, into a more sort of positive, uh, a more positive approach to that debate. Um, to answer your question absolutely bluntly, I find it quite difficult to imagine what role Rishi Sunak would take um, in a government led by Liz Truss. Not in any way because I think that he, he's, um, he, he personally dislikes her or anything like that, but he has held you know, such a pivotal role in the government over the last three years. I, I find it difficult to imagine him taking, if you like, a, a lesser role, but I could be doing him a great disservice. Uh, I think it's more likely that Liz well, Truss would continue to serve in a government led by uh, Rishi Sunak, but these are just tactical things. I'm not sure they necessarily go to the heart of the matter. Joanne Nadler, thank you very much. Well, let's hear from supporters of the two candidates. Now, conveniently for us, they both happen to be MPs in Stoke-on-Trent. I'm joined by Joe Gideon, who is the MP for Stoke-on-Trent Central since 2019, and Jonathan Gullis, elected in the same year for Stoke-on-Trent North, supporting Liz Truss. Welcome to you both. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. lovely to have the circus in town, isn't it? <laughs> well, all the world's media, the British press media, and all the rest of it uh, coming to Stoke. And this is an important place, not least for your party's prospects and winning in 2019, but winning again. Joe, first of all, um, what message do you think Rishi Sunak needs to get out in a place like this tonight and if he becomes prime minister beyond tonight? The message is very clear and, and Rishi has a, a very honest message. He's a very competent, he, as a chancellor, he really delivered for the people of Stoke-on-Trent, both in terms of uh, the levelling up funds that he, did, that he gave, but also during the pandemic, how he helped. And the message he needs to get out is that 
we're going to go through a, a bit of a tough time, but that's really important because we have to tackle inflation. Inflation is, is, is the the real problem um, for people on low incomes because you know when they go shopping they find that, that they, they can't buy enough and um, in order to tackle that we've got to uh, tighten our belts but he really is a low tax um, chancellor so you know, he will be a low tax prime minister tackle low inflation tax, but not yet exactly low tax but not yet so the message is tackle inflation grow the economy and that's the key thing tackle grow and then we can cut the taxes and people need to understand that so the guys, that looks like a very clear cut dividing line between the candidates because your argument and Mr. trust's argument is that economic orthodoxy hasn't delivered but how do you answer that concern that tax rises potentially as they did for Anthony Barber back in 1972 when he was a conservative chancellor give a kick to the economy and then the economy can't actually deal with it, can't absorb it. We import more goods from outside and inflation just carries on going up. Well, I think what's really exciting is we're having a battle of ideas and that's what the mm. Conservative Party has done. And at least both Liz and Rishi have very clear plans, unlike the Labour Party, who can't come up with anything. In fact, they just want to criticise what we do, yeah. which is, means that they're clueless themselves. What Liz is talking about is creating a low tax economy. Why is that urgently needed? Well, we know that energy bills are going up. That affects people in their households. So by removing green levies, that will save money, as well as stopping the national insurance rise but also if you look at the ceramic sector who are being smashed at the moment with energy prices going up because it's an energy intensive industry what Liz is wanting to do is to stop that corporation tax rise which would be another hit in their pocket preventing them from investing in their workforce investing in decarbonizing and making sure they're fit for the future none of which answers the question of what would disappear in order to fund this loss of revenue for for uh, reversing the tax cuts. What you have to remember is that actually Treasury has brought more money in, about 30 billion in terms of headroom uh, from the records that we can see. And of course, with thresholds having been frozen, with more people in the 40% bracket, with the rising cost of uh, fuel, which would obviously brought in a large amount of uh, money through the tax system, that the Treasury will have plenty of money to have that headroom to make these important cuts. And let's not forget the corporation tax hasn't yet come into force. I know it's in the forecast, but it's not yet come into effect. So let's give business confidence by preventing it from happening. Of course, one of the things it is in the forecast of national insurance rise. Your government changed the threshold, so it's now take, it's delivering half of the amount of money it's supposed to deliver for the health service and social care. Putting that aside, Johnson's point is quite a straightforward one. The Treasury is panicking unnecessarily. The Treasury has a track record of doing that in previous crises. There's wiggle room. There's room to maybe spend a bit more, put it if necessary on the borrowing, pay it back tomorrow. Well, so what does worry me is um, Liz's economic advisor actually said that the policies that she's putting forward will um, cause uh, interest rates to go up to 7%. Now, that will affect 13 million homeowners and their mortgages will go up on average £600 a month. Um, we've got a lot of homeowners and I think that the last thing we want to do is, is, to, is to punish people, having encouraged people to sort of, you know, buy their own home for the first time. That will be a massive shock. Um, I want to put you each a quote from an economist because I think it will give you a chance to rebut some of the outside criticism. This isn't party criticism, this isn't Labour Party criticism. We will hear from the Labour Party in studying later in this hour. This is from um, Samuel, Simon French at Panama uh, Corbyn uh, Economics who said the, uh, this was in response to Rishi Sunak's proposals. He said the turf war about inflationary impulse from tax cuts is a little like uh, arguing over the curtains in the Colosseum as Rome burns. In other words, the economic crisis is so fundamental, you have to try everything. So, I mean, that's, I think, that the most important thing that we, we both believe, that uh, within the, the leadership campaign there have been lots and lots of ideas, and I think, I think either candidate, when they become Prime Minister, will have a unity cabinet that will look and, and will, will bring the, the best ideas forward. Because quite honestly, none of us have got the solutions, you know, and, and the Labour Party certainly don't, and they don't have any ideas. That's either. very candid of you to say that. But what I'll, I'll put you the, the counter view, which is coming from uh, 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 this is from Samuel Toms at Pantheon at Macroeconomics, who says we're not buying Liz's Truss's argument that these tax cuts could uh, uh, help to boost the economy, he says, because of the, the concern about that it will stimulate growth, that's the hope, and offset any uh, effect they could have on inflation. They basically don't think 
she knows what she's talking about. What I love is that we're getting economists with different opinions, and that is economics for you. People have different views and different ideas. What Liz is doing is talking about bringing in tax cuts, both to businesses and to individuals, to help them through this very difficult, challenging time, to free up more money, their hard-earned money, to keep in their pockets, but also making sure that we create the growth in the economy we need. And growth leads to jobs. And we've seen that with the Ceramic Valley Enterprise Zone here in Stoke with 2,000 new jobs already. And Liz wants to build on that. She wants to create these growth zones, these investment zones, and build on the free ports, deregulate further, make sure we make planning simpler and easier and allow local areas to have more power and control over what they want to do and more control over the money that they raise as well. That's about putting money back in local areas and local people making local decisions. That's only a good thing. There's an imminent crisis <coughs> that's coming, and that is the view of some of the local campaigners here who work in things like the food banks, who work with poorer people, the Citizens Advice Bureau, I've heard from all of them in the course of this afternoon. And that is obviously the energy increase that's going to come in yes. October, which you would both be very well aware of. Yes. And isn't the problem for whichever of your candidates becomes Prime Minister on the 6th of September that they will have to make decisions? I mean, Rishi Sunak says he will declare a national uh, emergency and that will be galvanised government, but they will have to make decisions fast. All of this stuff is, is lovely for the longer term, but the crisis is now. Well, Liz is talking about what she wants to do is on day one and enact those changes. And look, Rishi as well. And at the end of the day, like you say, they have slightly different ideas on how to start this process, but they both agree that we should have a long-term low-tax economy. I just think Liz has got a plan that's going to put more money in people's pockets quickly by preventing the uh, NI rise, or by cutting the NI rise that's already just come into play, but also preventing the increase in corporation tax, which is going to stunt growth and investment in businesses, particularly, as I say, in our local area, who are desperate to decarbonise and hit that net zero target. Can I just say we have, Very a, briefly, yeah, we have a number of emergencies and waiting lists in the NHS is one, one such emergency that affects everybody, everybody in the country. Um, cutting the, 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 you know, removing the national insurance tax will have a, a massive impact on, on that, which is a really serious Joe Gideon and Jonathan Gullis, MPs for Stoke, thank you both very much. Hope you enjoy the debate. Uh, that debate begins at 8 o'clock. Both our guests there uh, referred to some of the issues that are facing uh, Stoke. We'll talk more about those in the next half hour. But first, let's pause, take a look at the weather prospects. Here's Matt Taylor. Thank you both. Hello. Whether you had the clouds today or not, it certainly felt a good deal colder compared with that list time last week. But temperatures were not far off where it would be normally for the stage in July. Some heavy showers around, though. They were drifting through uh, northeast England late afternoon and through tonight. They will push their way down towards east Anglia and southeast. Not quite as heavy as they were earlier in the day. A few isolated showers continue northwest England, northwest Midlands, some in the north and west of Scotland. Many actually, though, becoming dry with uh, clearer skies and a bit of a fresher start to Tuesday, even compared with Monday. Still some showers around those southern most counties of England, particularly to the southeast first thing. A few showers developing from overall cloudy skies for England and Wales. So brightening up in northern England, lots of sunshine through Wales, southwest, the Channel Islands, Isle of Man. Uh, sunny spells and isolated showers for Northern Ireland and fewer showers in Scotland compared with Monday. And even though we've got that northwesterly airflow which keeps things that bit cooler, the winds will be lighter, although temperatures will have dropped another degree or so, 17 to 22 Celsius, a little bit lower than normal for this stage in July. You're watching BBC News. I'm Sean Lay, broadcasting live from the Victoria Hall in the city of Soak on Strength in the English Midlands, where tonight the two candidates who would be the next British Prime Minister hold their first head to head debate. We're live with full coverage in the next half hour. Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss will be debating the issues here before a live audience, but they've already clashed over national policy on China and immigration. Labour's leader, Sakir Starmer, has attacked his Conservative rival's approach. He accused the Conservative Party of indulging in Thatcherite cosplay. Perhaps, and perhaps to fewer than 200,000 party members will make the choice of who is to be the country's next Prime Minister. The announcement comes on September the 5th. And the former leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, a key architect in the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement, which brought the Good Friday Agreement and an end to the Northern Ireland Troubles, has died at the age of 77.
Hello, I'm Sean Lay. A warm welcome to viewers around the world who are joining us here in Stoke. Behind me, you can probably see now filling up with journalists from the UK and around the world who will be reporting a debate that is not only about who will lead Britain's ruling Conservative Party over the next up to two years before a general election has to be held, but also who will be the UK's next Prime Minister in succession to Boris Johnson, who was deposed by his party a few weeks ago. One of the causes of that deposition was the resignation of his finance minister, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak. Well, he's one of the candidates tonight. The other is the serving Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, both of them with wide international experience, both of them acutely conscious of Britain's place in the world and the challenges of its involvement in the Ukraine war, its decision to leave the European Union and its search for trade deals around the globe. We begin tonight with words on the debate itself from its host, Sophie Rayworth. This is Victoria Hall in Stoke-on-Trent. Now, this is one of those so-called red wall seats that turned blue at the last election back in 2019. I'll be joined, of course, by the two candidates, but also by a studio audience, all people who voted Conservative, some for the first time, in 2019. I'm also joined tonight by our political editor, Chris Mason, our economics editor, Faisal Islam. Uh, Chris, what will you be looking for? A few fascinating things, I think, to keep an eye on tonight, Sophie. The first thing is our audience here. As you say, all Conservative voters last time round, some for the first time in 2019. So they were charmed by a Conservative Party led by Boris Johnson. So the biggest test in many senses for the two wannabe Prime Ministers at their lecterns later is to what extent can they charm this audience and keep them on side for the Conservative course? Because that will determine whether or not, in the end, they can be election winners. The other point is the tension between them. And to what extent does that bubble out tonight? Because the opinion polls and surveys suggest that Rishi Sunak, the former Chancellor, is considerably behind Liz Truss. So the stakes for him in particular are really high. And just a week before those ballot papers arrive with Conservative members, tonight arguably a chance for him to try and shift the dial. But with that, the stakes are high. And Faisal, one thing that does divide them, the economy. Yeah, there's a material chance that this uh, leadership campaign leads to a change in economic policy. That's both tax and spend and possibly monetary policy, what the Bank of England does too. These are up in the air. Uh, and crucially, this all leads back to the cost of living crisis and what might change for households at home. Uh, various policies are being offered. We haven't had all the detail. We'll be looking very carefully to see if it all adds up. So that's uh, what people can expect when the programme begins uh, at the top of the next hour. Let's talk now to someone who's been an insider in the Conservative Party and in government as well, Anita Wasseng, who joins us now. Anita, thank you very much for being with us on BBC News. I wonder if I could ask you, first of all, particularly for those people who know little or nothing about British politics, to give us a little pen portrait of these two candidates. Rishi Sunak first. I think the Chancellor, or the former Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, is someone who considers himself to be a strong debater, who considers himself to be very serious when it comes to tackling the challenges that the economy faces, and who considers himself to be someone who is trustworthy. And that's the reason why I think he's made that such a central plank of his economic platform. And he's really trying to tell the party, um, like he's been trying to tell MPs, and eventually, if he succeeds, will be telling the public that it's time to be realistic and responsible and that's about making tough choices to steward the economy on to safer grounds i think that is the thing that's going to come through in these debates this evening um he did resign from the cabinet and so for some conservatives presumably that will be enough of a reason not to uh support him because he didn't show loyalty in their view to the outgoing prime minister boris johnson liz trust did stay loyal but she's characterizing herself as the insurgent how come well, I think there's two different questions here, right? There's a question of um, loyalty to Boris Johnson, which I think is um, one part of the campaign, though I would argue actually not as big a factor as you might imagine. But the second is about challenging orthodoxy. You know, Liz Truss has very much presented herself as ripping up the economic rule book and saying that there is a way that you don't have to make tough choices and you can, quote unquote, go for growth and as such deliver the kinds of revenue that you need to mean that you don't need to raise taxes significantly. So I think it's an insurgent campaign insofar as she is challenging quite a long period of economic orthodoxy. Um, let's talk about what 
the risks and the rewards are of a debate of this kind. Is it a format that is going to flatter the candidates or would there be some concern, particularly in the party and perhaps in government, that it might simply encourage division? I think that's a very good question. Both of the candidates sort of need this to go incredibly well. The stakes are very high. You know, the former Chancellor Rishi Sunak kind of needs a game changer. It's very clear from the polling. It's telling one consistent story, which is that party members are not yet convinced that, that Sunak would be the best prime minister. And Truss, you know, who's, who's admitted freely to not being the strongest debater, definitely needs to not fall over or trip up or do anything to um, to weaken her um, lead amongst voters. I think that's a really good general question about the health of the party. Um, so far, these debates have been um, robust um, and some of that's been really great because it's been focused on the issues and it's really important that if the Conservative Party is going to once again pull off the coup of renewing an office, it's able to air its differences and really come with a, you know, you don't have two candidates basically saying, I'm Boris, I will do what Boris Johnson did, but I will just do it better because I'll be more competent and more trustworthy. They are really setting out slightly different economic and actually broader stalls for the party to decide between. But that obviously is difficult for the party because it does mean, in some ways, critiquing what has come before. Um, and so there is a fear about, you know, this could be ammunition for the Labour Party. But fundamentally, if the Conservative Party can find itself a strong prime minister who can put a, a new perspective to the country, that will help the Conservative Party succeed in the next general election. Now, a lot of the audience will be people who voted Conservative at the last election. A lot of the people watching won't be Conservative voters, certainly not Conservative Party members. How big a challenge is that to try and bridge the gap between what Conservative supporters might want to hear and what people who aren't Conservatives might want to hear from the Prime Minister of their country? Well, at this stage, I think it's right that the two members are talking to Conservatives. Um, and I would say that members, Conservative members and Conservative voters are not that far apart. They might have slightly different economic backgrounds, slightly, members might be slightly less diverse, might be slightly older. But, but in terms of their core tenets of the belief, I've never really been convinced that they're that different. Um, I think a lot of people will be watching this just to, just to see the new candidates for the first time and potential prime ministers for the first time. I think at this stage, in terms of what the ultimate prize is, they will be very focused on winning over Conservative voters. But part of that, and part of winning over Conservative members in particular, is being able to convince them that they can win a general election. So there is this dual game going on, right, of one-upmanship with your opponent, of wanting to paint a vision for the future whilst not denigrating everything that happened in the past, and also of wanting to talk to Conservative Party members, but also making sure that a electability is always foremost in their minds because Conservative members do really care about being able to have a Prime Minister that wins elections. Anita Berteng, former uh, Conservative Special Advisor, thank you very much. Very interesting thoughts there on why this matters and how they might handle the debate to come at the top of the hour. Let's talk to Annalise Dodds now. Annalise uh, was former shadow chancellor for Labour. Uh, she now uh, speaks for the party on women and equalities, and she also has an important campaigning role. Annalise Stodds, thank you very much for being with us on BBC News. Let me ask you, first of all, about what you think is the challenge that two members of the uh, Boris Johnson cabinet, one current, one former, have to answer tonight. Well, I think the challenge for both of them is to show whether they continue to be those continuity candidates. Both of them have been deeply implicated in the last 12 years that we've seen of Conservative-led governments. Those 12 years that now are resulting in a low growth crisis, in our cost of living crisis being so intense in Britain compared to in other countries, and our public services being in crisis and so on and so forth. And I'm afraid they've been trying desperately, both of them, to distance themselves from all the decisions they've been implicated in. You know, those 15 Tory tax rises that we've seen 
over recent months, but ultimately they have been responsible for that failure. And we don't see any new clear plans coming from either of them, from either Liz Truss or indeed from Rishi Sunak. We don't see those plans for the stronger, more secure economy that we need. Keir Starmer was setting out those plans today. I'm afraid they certainly weren't coming from those Conservative candidates. I'm glad you mentioned Sakir's speech today. One of the planks of that was the proposals for a new body to develop industrial strategy. Some voters might ask, after 12 years in opposition, you're proposing to take office and then develop an industrial strategy. Yet the Chancellor, at least, the former Chancellor, is saying there's a crisis and we would have to deal with it on day one. And we would deal with it on day one. And that's why this council that Keir set out is one of a number of elements that we have already said the government needs to be introducing right now. You know, we've been very clear that we need to be buying, making and selling far more in our own country, using the power of procurement to be attracting jobs to our country rather than effectively giving them away, which is what we've seen time and time again under Conservative-led governments. We set out how we would be delivering economic security and energy security. Again, right now, we would be insulating homes, getting people's bills down on average by about £400, not just this year, but every year into the future. So Keir was setting out additional elements of our economic strategy today, but we have been very, very clear about our plans. And I would just outline again the difference between Labour and the Conservatives there, being clear about our plans. Also, incidentally, Labour being very clear about how we would pay for those plans. You know, we're not setting out unfunded tax cuts here, there and everywhere like these Conservative candidates. We said, for example, we would cut VAT on energy bills and we said how we paid for that. We would pay for that by starting that windfall tax earlier, by not going ahead with the government's plans on investment allowance. You know, we think the British people deserve respect and that includes respect around how their money will be used to drive economic growth in the future under Labour. Now, in terms of the real political reality of the situation, the Conservatives still have a significant parliamentary majority, as showed by them unsurprisingly winning the vote of confidence that they called in preference to the one that your party had proposed. They therefore have up to two years under a new Prime Minister to establish a fresh start, to change gear, to, as they would see it, kind of uh, reform themselves in office. Isn't that a real political risk for you as an opposition party that you've spent the last couple of years honing your attacks on Boris Johnson? You now will have to do with, deal with a completely different leader. Well, the fact is that the next Conservative leader is not going to be completely different. I mean, we saw Boris Johnson trying to distance himself from Conservative policies. He wasn't able to do that. The same will be the case with Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, because they have been implicated in the last 12 years that we've seen those years of really slow growth in the UK compared to other nations and predicted slow growth if we continue with those Conservative policies. In fact, the slowest growth out of all of the G20, apart from Russia being predicted for our country under Conservative policies. So I'm afraid what we're likely to see is yet more Conservative continuity. Whether it's Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak, we won't be seeing that fresh start with either of them. There would be a fresh start with Labour. That's where the difference lies. Let me ask you finally, uh, Annelise Dodds, uh, about something that John Cordwell, the uh, entrepreneur, uh, philanthropist, very successful businessman who comes from this area, grew up in Stoke, still lives locally, was saying. He's desperate to see growth. He's desperate to see increases in productivity. He'd like to see more finance to help startups and develop new businesses, particularly in an area like the potteries. One way the two candidates have both said they would do it is by easing the Solvency II regulations that were passed by the EU to allow pension funds in particular to invest in some of the things that aren't listed to give new startups fresh capital. Is that the kind of reform that a Labour government or a Labour party in opposition indeed could endorse? Well, I have to say we've seen a lot of noise around those kind of reforms for a very, very long time 
from the Conservatives, and they haven't delivered on that. You know, Labour set out again very clear plans about how we would get startups going. We've announced an ambition of 100,000 new startups. We've set out how we would deliver that. We've also set out how we would be completely removing that business rates regime that holds so many startups back at the beginning of their economic lives and how we would be radically reforming that system to be fairer for business. So what I really want to see tonight from Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss isn't yet more promises around some of these regulatory issues. I actually want them to be acting on that change that's needed for business rather than yet more vague promises, because frankly, we've had those from the Conservatives for many, many years. Let me ask you finally about Labour's record in Stoke. Uh, you lost all three parliamentary seats over the course of a couple of elections. You lost control of the council. It is now run by the Conservatives jointly with independents as a minority administration. I was talking to one party member who is also involved prominently in local community groups on this channel this afternoon. And she said, really, Labour had to accept it to let down the people of Stoke. Isn't there in all the attacks on the Conservative record, particularly as it affects this part of England, perhaps room for a bit of humility from the Labour Party, which had political control of this area for decades and yet saw it decline? Well, of course, Labour had to be and continues to be humble after, unfortunately, we lost that 2019 general election, including, um, of course, our representation in Stoke, quite so catastrophically. Of course, we need to reflect on what happened there, learn those lessons. And we have been doing that. We've been doing that, in fact, every single day because I'm absolutely determined. And I've talked with many people in Stoke over the years. I know how ambitious they are for their communities, the huge potential that there is in places like Stoke. And just as Keir said this morning, we have got to have that stronger, more secure, fairer economy for the future. And that means using what should be the wealth of places like Stoke, that incredible industrial heritage, the people based there, the energy, the ambition that they have for their areas. That must be delivered on. And we've had so much hot air around this with alleged levelling up recently. It's not delivered. Labour is setting out how we will change that into the future. We will make sure we have that stronger, more secure economy up and down the country. And I hope that people in Stoke will be hearing that and will be looking again at Labour. Certainly that's been my experience, that people are looking again at Labour, even if they turned away from us previously. Annalise Dodds from the Labour Party, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Well, let's talk finally about the challenge of this debate in particular in terms of the context of this part of England. These are the seats, remember, that have tended to be summarised as the Red Wall. It's a bit further south, Stoke, than the Red Wall. The English uh, novelist of the early 20th century wrote of the five towns because he thought it sounded better than the six towns. And in fact, there are six towns that make up Stoke. They're at the heart of the potteries. They were at the heart of the coal industry for many years. Globalisation has changed the nature of employment in lots of places no less than the case here in Stoke. I'm joined by Dr Phil Catney. Phil is from Keel University in Staffordshire, from the neighbouring town Newcastle underline where your university is based. From your perspective, what do you see as the challenge that faces the Conservatives in holding on here in terms of what has happened in this part of England and in those places that were once loyally Labour? for so many decades, some cases for a century, ever since the Labour Party was founded, but in 19, 2019, or indeed in the couple of years before, slipped out of Labour's hands and into the Conservatives. Yes, well, the Conservative Party was very effective at um, uh, opportu being opportunistic around Labour's problems. Labour was governing a lot of post-industrial towns in the north of England that have struggled economically. And there are very complex reasons why these cities are left behind, fallen behind, uh, unproductive, whatever language you want to use. But the simple reality is that they have, they've got very significant challenges that need to be addressed. Poverty is very high in cities like Stoke-on-Trent, but in the Red Wall. Now, the Conservatives have won... 
a large majority in 20, 2019 on the promise of levelling up. Boris Johnson's shtick was about levelling up. Uh, they need to do this. Now, the problem they have is that many of the councils in the north of England are still significant um, employers in the local area, but they've seen significant cuts in their budgets over the last decade. I mean, 10 years ago, I think I'm right, saying that Stoke Council was the biggest employer in yes, Stoke. Yes, yes, it was. And uh, it's it seen you know, hundreds of millions of pounds taken off it when they changed the nature of how you calculated uh, the, the central government block grant that came to local authority areas. So it's ironic at one level the Conservatives created this financial problem and then benefited from it because the councils took the blame. But that's the nature of central local government relations to <laughs> the UK. National government sets the financial envelope for local government. Uh, people don't often realise how little is, is actually raised locally and spent locally. Um, but the point there is that the Conservatives have to think of a way of now continuing this legacy. What we'll possibly hear, maybe, uh, given the location I hope we do, uh, is hear some clear ideas about what they're going to do. How are they going to generate this enterprise? Is it going to be more low tax, free ports, but inland uh, in Silicon Trail. We've had this early in the last decade. Well, they've had the canal, I guess. Yes, they had the canal. <laughs> Go back to the 19th century idea to transportation. But, but seriously, th there's a serious problem here about how we regenerate a place that's got such legacy issues. Um, it's got a poorly interconnected city. Uh, it's got significant pockets of de deprivation that simply aren't going to disappear overnight. And significant investment needs to be made in these areas. But how? And that's what we're going to listen to listening for tonight. Thank you very much for now, Phil. We'll, we'll speak again. Let's talk to uh, Graham Hutton now, who is the leader of Newcastle Underlying Council. As I say, we was saying to Phil there, uh, Graham, yours is the next uh, community along from Stoke. But it's fair to say, isn't it, that the two areas really flow into each other. From your perspective in local government, what do you want to hear from the two respective candidates tonight that might give you some hope for your town, which also is one that was once Labour but became Conservative? Uh, uh, just a slight correction. I'm the leader of the uh, Newcastle Conservative Association, not the council. Forgive me. Um, that's OK. Uh, they're standing as leader, so what do I expect from a leader? I expect good communication skills, a view of what the future is going to be. Uh, I want them to, to know their own strengths and, and build a strong team and actually delegate to that team rather than try and do everything themselves. So that's what I'm looking for. Uh, I, at the moment, I'm quite happy to have either of them, and, uh, but the hustings have to show me uh, how, how good they are at addressing what we expect to see in a leader, and particularly addressing the issue of Ukraine, which is causing the cost of living crisis, and building the, the economy so it's fit for the future. Are they talking too much about tax at the moment? Um, it depends. It, you know, you'll always find an economist to back your position. Uh, I, I do think that we have to grow the economy and probably bring some things back uh, that we've uh, outsourced to China. I think COVID and the uh, Putin's uh, war in Ukraine has shown us the the fragility of the uh, supply chain. And we've got to get that much more into control in this country. So uh, that, that's the start. Let's get that supply chain uh, sorted and our energy uh, sorted. So, um, uh, and th those are all possible. They're all easy to do in it relatively. Um, let me ask you finally about one other thing that Phil mentioned uh, and several of my interviews have mentioned today, and that is levelling up. It's a phrase that people seem to have kind of absorbed. They now have a sense of what it's supposed to mean, but they're still doubtful over how much has actually been achieved on that agenda. You're at the sharp end of it. How big well, a challenge well, does that remain for the government? We, 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 we've got over 50 million in Newcastle underline, and... Uh, if you come back in 18 months, two years' time, you'll see a massive difference in the town centre. We're, we've already started, we've uh, knocked down the old council offices. We're building a uh, lot more housing in the centre because housing brings footfall and that supports the uh, uh, retail and the leisure industry. So I, Newcastle is looking at a rosy future. We've got a lot of new jobs coming. We'll be building new houses to support people. 
And I, I think levelling up is working for places like Newcastle because we're getting the investment and we're, uh, we're being supported by government to support our very well-run council. Graham Hutton there, uh, Chairman of the Newcastle Underlying Conservative Association. Apologies for getting your title run. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's talk a bit briefly before we go back to Phil a little bit about the heritage of this area because it's a very important part of what makes Stoke special. It really dates from the last quarter of the 18th century when the Trent and Mersey Canal was dug. Abundant supplies of both coal and clay combined together with the talent of ceramicists and potters to make products that made Stoke a name around the world. Dalton, Minton, Wedgwood, of course, Josiah Wedgwood, the great champion of Stoke. I've been talking to a man who, whether you watch television in the UK or around the world, you may know, well know, Eric Knowles, who is a ceramic specialist on the popular programme Antiques Roadshow, among many others. He gave me a sense of why that legacy of ceramics is so important to Stoke. Way back in the, the Middle Ages through into the, the 17th century, it would, and into the early 18th century, it was just a cottage industry. Um, uh, people making pots to supply the, the local area. And then with the advent of um, the Industrial Revolution, and in particular, um, Josiah Wedgwood, um, then everything changed. Uh, the factory systems came into uh, being and huge volumes were uh, being made uh, for everyday use as well as some exceptional pieces that would have been decorated for um, for those with uh, deep pockets. But Stoke in later years became famous for, for steelworks um, and coal mining. I think it was the, the fact that coal was in the area and the local clays were in the area um, that the, the pottery industry uh, actually did begin to thrive. Now, it goes without saying that in the last 20 years or more, the pottery industry in Stoke has taken a, a, a serious hit. I mean, there are um, uh, potters out there um, who are doing good business, um, but a lot of them are just small time. When I say small time, I'm, I mean, they are basically uh, operations of three or four or five people. So in some ways, uh, the pottery industry in Stoke has reverted back to that almost cottage industry. So there's still some great pots being made in Stoke-on-Trent. But I've been going there for the past 45 years and more. I've, I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm something of an honourable Stokey. Um, the museums there are breathtaking. If you're, if you're a pottery person, uh, Stoke-on-Trent is Nirvana. So if you are heading to England for a holiday, put the potteries on your schedule. Uh, that's it from me here in the Victoria Hall in Stoke. In just a few moments' time, we'll be going inside the hall to my left, where we'll be hearing from the two candidates who would be the next Conservative leader and Britain's next Prime Minister.